Hey, so I'm Dan. Um, I am the Vice President of Global Partnerships for WISC. Uh, and so WISC is actually a joint venture between the Boeing Company and a company called Kitty Hawk. And what we're developing is the first uh, US-based self-flying air taxi. Um, and so what that means is basically uh, providing services like ground-based taxis, but in the air. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm, I come from a family of avi aviators. I, uh, my, most of my family are either pilots or uh, flight attendants of some form. Um, grew up next to the Santa Monica airport and uh, had, had flying in my blood ever since. So it's, uh, it's great to be here and to, to meet with folks. I was interested in, in reading the joint venture. My dad worked at Boeing my whole life growing up in the Renton plant. And we think of Kitty Hawk and we have this, I mean, that's where aviation started. Here in Santa Barbara, it was the uh, the home of the Lockheed brothers. Um, so Lockheed started here in Santa Barbara. So I'm, I'm really interested in this topic. Yet um, the first thing that comes to mind, we, we've put links to the website so people can go see what, what this means. My first question is, because um, the videos are kind of staggering, what, what the promise is, how how far away is it to where we could actually have this type of autonomous air taxi? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and, and of course, these are my own ideas, right? So I should say that I'm um, <laughs> saying this in my own capacity and not that as of WISC or any of its affiliates. But with that being said, I think we're really close. I think mm. that there are so many, right now there's upwards of 200 to 500, depending on how you count, companies that are actually interested in just doing air taxi work. No kidding, 500? Yeah, yeah it's, it's wild. Now, about 10% of those actually have uh, an aircraft that they've actually tested and flown. Um, so I think we're very close. But the exciting thing is not how close we are to actually the services that are gonna start, but it's the future of what those services could be in the out years. I think, you know, oh. in just the beginning, we're talking about, oh, okay, we'll have passenger operations or maybe some limited cargo operations. But really, it, so I, I'm, I'm excited for the start of it because it's a whole new industry within aviation, but really it's those out years that are gonna be most exciting because people are gonna start coming up with these, a whole new set of use cases just based on the tools that we've now been able to provide them. Um, so people are talking about, you know, air ambulances um, and the ability to do offshore deliveries to communities that are generally left behind by traditional transportation. So a lot of neat stuff going on. Okay, a, a billion questions. One of the <laughs> things, though, about aviation that I love is it's on the, the leading edge of technological innovation, right? Things happen. I mean, let's think NASA that's aviation, right? So, so many things get developed for the space program from, I mean, we, there's a million we could list. What are some of the advances that you've had to make um, there that are going to be things that will become, you know, common, uh, like our, our grandkids will probably study them uh, in years to come and say, oh yeah, that's when, you know, in the beginning. Yeah. So for our industry, I think one of the biggest changes that we're seeing now is, uh, well, it's twofold. It's, it's driving to this electric propulsion model. Um, and that has all, you know, besides having its own technical merits, it has a tremendous amount of sustainability, you know, points to it. Um, but it's also the batteries that are, that are part of that. So mm. on the electric side, one of the, the key differences uh, that we can actually do with electric propulsion that we can't do with traditional propulsion is the ability to provide numerous what we'll call propulsors around an aircraft. Whereas traditionally, you've got maybe one propulsor at the front or maybe you've got two hanging underneath the wings in the form of jets. Um, with distributed electric propulsion, you could put numerous different uh, either jets or little props um, and you can put them all around the wing so that you can not only provide that lift where you want it, but also you can do it in a very controlled manner and even a quieter manner, which is a whole nother part of this, which is the noise that the noise promises that uh, electric aviation really can provide. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a, I think the biggest step change is really this distributed electric propulsion. I was looking at the video and, and again, looking at, you call them propulsors, you which I love that. Yeah. Props is fine. <laughs> and, and the fact that, that all that gets fine tuned 
in in reading more about what's happening here again staying on this what needed to be invented um how does ai figure into all of that because we've we've you know there's a lot of autonomous car in the news and we look at the cameras and all of the challenges that they have so i'm going to guess now in this jetsons future that we're talking about that you have probably the same yet different problems yeah so yeah for sure i focused on the airframe to start with which was the electric side but then your point is absolutely right the next level of the of the scaling of this of this technology in this industry is really around the autonomous side of it, um, which is why our company, for example, is going directly to that. Um, and and it is certainly there are challenges um, that not only on the technology development side, but also on you know just the public perception and how we make sure right. that this doesn't uh, you know it, it connotes safety um, and in terms of you know your your. There's tons of human error that could be introduced into traditional aviation, whether it's, you know, the person in the plane, the person on the ground doing maintenance, the person in air traffic control, there's humans in that loop. Right. Um, and a lot of times they do a great job of saving the day, but they also come with our own, you know, fallacies. For example, like these two bags of water in my head, I'm a pilot, they're getting worse every day, I can tell you that. Um, but if you imagine an artificial intelligence, it could actually pull in data sources from around from around itself and even further than we as humans could ever sense. So you actually could envelop it with a set of data that is actually safer. Um, so that's kind of the way that we think through it is always making sure that, yes, there's, there's kind of a, a human there to make sure that the system is working, but really trying to take advantage of those technologies and those, and those data sets that can help make it even safer. So, so yeah, the AI development, it has, its, it has both a technical and a, and kind of a, a community engagement aspect to it. Oh, what, what do you mean community engagement aspect? So it's not just uh, it's not just making sure that the privacy and the ethics of it are all true uh, and, and work for the communities that are going to use these aircraft, but it's also the communities that live around and near these aircraft. So, for example, hmm. um, making sure that uh, let's well, we'll go back to noise, for example, um, there's a lot of challenges around airports as it relates to noise. Yep. And so how do we make sure that we're this industry is engaging with folks that traditionally uh, maybe have had real challenges with airport noise, and now we can maybe tap into some of these new technologies, whether it's the electric propulsion side or the artificial intelligence, to be able to make things quieter so that it's less of a nuisance for, for folks out there that live near these places where uh, these aircraft might be operating, like airports or heliports or stuff like that. It's ironic that uh, EVs have had to put in noise generating devices because they're so quiet. Uh, you don't know they're coming up. Um, hopefully we don't have to do that with airplanes. However, I do know that real estate prices are depressed around airports for that exact reason. Yeah, well, and this is kind of one of the big, you know, ideas in our industry now is how do we kind of look through the lens of people who are traditionally left behind as new forms of transportation are, are kind of debuted, right? So highways are built, freeways are built, airports are built generally this negatively affects a certain demographic, a certain socioeconomic community. Yes. And those folks are traditionally left behind, not only in the use of the, the new form of, of transportation, but also in the infrastructure that's built to support mm. those new forms of transportation. So one of the things that we're also taking into mind is how do we, how do we make sure that we don't leave behind those that are traditionally left behind? as we're looking at new infrastructure opportunities, or we're looking at new, new modes of, of, and routes of, of flights, for example, how do we make sure that we're getting an entire holistic engagement of the community? What is the, I mean, you're out there on the front lines, building partnerships and working with municipalities and out there, you know, uh, my job in computer animation back in the day, I was the ambassador for this whole new way of making movies. And now you're the ambassador to go out there and try to, to build these partnerships. What's, what's the question they don't ask you when you leave the meeting? You're like, hmm, they never asked me about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think in general, um, it's, when it's municipalities, for example, and it all depends on the audience, as you know, 
Um, but I think with the cities, it's really a question of what are the initial operations look like versus the future, right? Because I think a lot of folks are automatically, to your point, think the Jetsons uh, and we'll have cars zipping around um, and it's going to be it maybe even a little chaotic. I think one of the things that, that at least in the U.S., we've really realized is that with aviation, you want to be safe. And safety generally relates to or connotes being methodical and, and really focusing on mm. taking your time and doing it right the first time and really learning from the challenges we've had in the past in aviation. So one of the things I think that cities generally don't ask is, well, in your first 100 days, how many flights do you think you'll do? I think many of them would be surprised with how, how few flights were any of the companies in the industry are going to start with. Now, we talk about the scaling and the opportunity, and, and much of that is for other audiences, um, but cities generally, they, they generally don't ask that. What does the first two years look like? Um, I think that's an important point. So last week, we had um, the CEO of Rewiring America on, where it's, we're going to electrify any, everything. So now you're, you're talking about electrifying air travel. And you said something earlier that got me thinking that it could be a propeller or it could be a jet. Um, I'm not an aero scientist, so I don't know. I know what a propeller is. I know what a jet is, but a jet feels like that's a, is that, could that be an electric thing? And what's the difference? It's just a bigger, faster turbine. Is that all it is? Yeah, there are ways. Um, so there are ways, basically a jet is, where a propeller is spinning and kind of grabbing into the air in a very similar okay. way that a boat propeller grabs sure. into the water, right? Sure. Uh, a jet kind of funnels that air into a confined environment, compresses it, and then fires it out the back. And there's a lot oh. of different ways that jets can okay. do that. Okay. Um, and so traditional jet engines, for example, they do that compression, sprinkle some gas in, light it, and then combustion. Boom. Um, there are other forms of jets like a ramjet or a scramjet where it actually, the jet gets up to a speed where it actually, the air is coming in so fast that when it hits a little wall like that, and actually the air itself compresses. So there's a lot of different ways to, to create a jet. Um, and so there are companies out there right now that are looking at how do we take an electric and make an electric jet? Um, and there's some great ideas out there um, that kind of push through that. So. Uh, this the whole technology part of it fascinates me yet i'm thinking of uh, the adoption curves and as we go through these horizons of innovation from you know where we are today what's the next new thing and then where's the disruption and then where's the transformation we know that with evs there there are stakes in the ground right now gm's made a stake in the ground there are several stakes in the ground like by this date and so when we think about the infrastructure, I was talking to someone at a gas station. It's like, yeah, that's not going to exist. Like, we're not going to need that. There's a whole level of things that are going to go away. Having me just say that, what do you think is the, the timeline for where this is not novel? Is it 50 years from now, 30 years from now? I don't know. Like, there are days where I sit in a jet, uh, just flew the other day, and I thought to myself, it is fascinating that we were able to get, you know, an aluminum tube, strap on some other, <laughs> right. you know, bits of right. aluminum, titanium, right. put some gas in there, and it goes, right? So yeah. Yeah. I, when will it be commonplace? I would imagine that it'll be, it'll be pretty new and novel for the next decade or two. Um, but I think very quickly after that, people are gonna realize the, the use cases, like I was saying earlier, and the opportunity that exists. And I think it will be a lot more commonplace, so. Does Moore's law apply here? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it does, uh, you know, because we're dealing with hardware, I think there's a, a bit of that. The more interesting thing is uh, around battery capacity. And that was my next we, question. Yeah. You know, really kind of bend the laws of chemistry to, to really drive to the next tier of, of battery capability. Um, and, you know, it's not just the cells, right? It's also the enclosures and whatnot. All of that's getting lighter and smaller and faster. Um, and so the, that is really kind of, to me, the next big unlock as it relates to to electric aviation is, is really, how do we get to that next plateau of battery capability? 
one of the questions that comes up in, in these kinds of discussions is um, uh, abandoning the use of petroleum products, like in making plastic, for instance, right? We don't, we think when we general public thinks, oh, you know, not even burning gas is great. Yeah. And how much, what's the carbon footprint uh, to, to, you know, do everything else? Are you, and, and I believe you guys are doing some work on the material side. Um, what can we look forward to there? Yeah, so that is another really exciting area. Um, and it's luckily we're able to tap into a lot of the last couple of decades of work that's being done on the traditional aviation side, um, whether it's, you know, composites. I mean, composites are the, are the, big, right. the big thing here, especially in the last 20 years. And so where we're able to kind of tap into that, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of those technologies are now kind of commonplace in aviation. And so how are we able to then build upon that for, you know, lighter materials that are stronger than their predecessors, um, really kind of driving there. And then in addition to the idea of sustainability, how do we also look at materials through the lens of wanting to decrease our carbon footprint? Um, and, and not necessarily the petroleum that's in the product, but looking at it downstream and upstream. And how do we make sure that we're, we're cognizant of that in a way that I don't know if aviation necessarily has looked at in the, in the prior, you know, kind of epochs, if you will. Dan, I am, I am so glad you guys are working on these problems. And I, I hope to ride in one of these devices. Be <laughs> you will. Maybe I'll go to one of my great grandchildren's wedding in it. Maybe. Uh, I have a feeling you'll be able to ride in one much sooner than that.